In the beginning, part 16, Social Darwinism, Some Consequences of Evolutionary Thinking. Uh, we've been studying the book. Uh, in the beginning, Science and Scripture Confirm Creation. It's uh, edited by Brian Ball, who got his start in England, uh, got a MA in Religion from Andrews and a PhD from the University of London, which seems to be a common place to get one. Um, became a church pastor, evangelist, uh, North England Conference president, and then moved on to Avondale, where he became principal, and is now currently president of the South Pacific Division. He, you know, I don't know. Um, uh, I do know the PhD of uh, uh, Reinder Brunsma, but uh, um, the book itself is mostly about theology because their viewpoint is that uh, uh, theology is the most important part. So they talk about the transmission of the text, arguments against higher criticism, a view consonant with Jesus in the New Testament, theological difficulties with other uh, viewpoints. But it does, and I think it should, contain scientific chapters by uh, Tim Standish, Grenville Kent, uh, John Walton, James Gibson, and uh, Ariel Roth here. Um, it also deals with theistic evolution and evolutionary morality, and we're going to be talking about evolutionary morality today. Uh, theistic evolution will uh, be reserved for the next time we come back to the book. Uh, this particular chapter, Social Darwinism, is uh, written by Reinder Brunsma, who uh, it was born in the Netherlands in 1942. There was a little commotion going on at the the, during his early years in Europe. Um, Little. Pardon? Little. Little. Um, he got his Bachelor of Divinity from the University of London and his PhD from the University of London and it had to do with relationships between the Adventist uh, Church and uh, the Catholic Church. Um, and he's been an advocate of uh, of uh, a reproachment between the churches uh, ever since. Uh, he has held various positions in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, mostly in Europe. Um, from 1995 to 2001, he was executive trans uh, secretary of the Trans-European Union. In 2001 to 2007, he was president of the Netherlands Union. Somehow I got the feeling that he was uh, vice president of the General Conference at one time, but I uh, was unable to document that. Um, he came out of retirement in 2011 to become president of the Belgium-Luxembourg Conference, and that's what he's doing today. He starts out his... Uh, chapter saying there have been several widely reported terrorist attacks in recent years that have resulted in a great loss of human life, besides the 9-11 atrocity in New York, which of course is Muslim, the um, Columbine School massacre and the uh, Tuusula High School shooting in Finland come to mind. Um, he is of course closer to Finland than most of us are. Uh, following November, 20, uh, November 7, 2007, the Jokela High School in Tuusula, Finland, I'm probably butchering those, but uh, I'm open to correction, was in the news all around the world. Pekka Eric Avenin, an 18-year-old uh, student, shot his teacher with a pistol, then killed several fellow students before he turned the we his weapon on himself. Witnesses have stated that the killer seemed to make a deliberate selection of his victims as if he wanted to weed out those he felt were unfit to live. And in fact, there is reason to think that this was indeed the case. There is evidence that Pika was not just a troubled young man who went crazy after taking too many antidepressants, but was a convinced social Darwinist determined to do his part in the much needed work of promoting the idea of survival of the fittest. In a YouTube film, which has been subsequently removed, he emphasized that the deeds he planned, were, uh, planned, the deed he planned was not inspired by computer games, films, or books, but rather by his Darwinist convictions. 
there is reason to believe that the infamous Columbine shooting in 1999 in which 13 people were brutally killed also had a definite link with Darwin's theory of evolution, although this time it's a little more difficult to exclude such things as computer games. One of the two killers, Eric Harris, wrote a, a, wore a natural selection t-shirt and there is evidence that the two young men had been convinced through their evolution classes in school that inferior types were expendable. These incidents, as bizarre and rare as they may be, are vivid reminders of the far-reaching implications of the Darwinian ideology. This chapter will survey some of the many ways in which Darwinism has influenced various aspects of life, impacting on many disciplines besides biology and natural history. Other contributors to the present volume have commented on the theological and scientific implications of evolutionary thinking and on the extreme and often almost irrational way in which some atheistic proponents of the evolution gospel have tried to vilify and ridicule those who depend, defend the biblical view of origins. But it is vital also to point out that the theory of evolution has been and still is a strong influence in several domains of life other than biology. Many generally accepted anthropological theories leave no room for the biblical account of the origin of man as they, quote, visualized a gradual divergence of man and apes from a common ancestor, end quote, some 70 million years ago. And at this point, I cringe a little bit. It's more like seven. The great majority of geologists work within an evolutionary framework, uh, which could probably be phrased better, as do most physicians. Other dis uh, physicists, I'm sorry, other disciplines also including psychology, sociology, philosophy, and history base their approach nowadays largely on evolutionary assumptions. Medical research and practice, and I'm going, uh -huh. economic theories and political ideolo uh, ideologies, including Christian teachings about war and peace, have also been deeply affected by evolutionary principles. Moreover, it has been convincingly shown that Darwinis Darwinian ideas exer exerted a determinative influence on such totalitarian mo movement as Nazism and Communism. And although the Seventh-day Adventists have been among the fiercest critics of evolution, it cannot be denied that at times they also, perhaps unwittingly, have not been beyond the reach of some of the ideas derived from Darwinian principles. In this chapter, we will focus in particular on the emergence of so-called social Darwinism and some important developments that are rooted in it. However, before we attempt to define what we mean by that term, we need to remind ourselves briefly of core Darwinian thinking as such, even though it has been defined by previous contributors to this book. So he's going to go over the implications of natural selection. Natural selection and the survival of the fittest are among the key concepts of evolutionary thought. After years of observing and studying plants and animals in several parts of the world, Charles Darwin concluded that the origin of biological species may be best explained on the basis of slow adaptations to changing environments through variation and natural selection. The subject matter of this second important book, however, was even more significant for the issues addressed below in the descent of man and selection in, its relation, in relation to sex published in 1871, Darwin addressed the evolution of man and his close relationship with apes, but also developed theories that went beyond biological factors and ventured into the area of the evolution of man's mental powers and even his moral and ethical faculties. Darwinian theories about the origin of the human race and about the survival of the fittest were, of course, not developed in a vacuum. Others, prior to Darwin, and contemporary with him had already suggested an evolutionary approach to nature. Important names such as the British geologist Charles Lyell and the atheistic German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche come to mind, while the ideas propagated by the famous demographer Thomas Malthus also played a significant role. Subsequently, other scientists and philosophers built on the evolutionary platform that was popularized by Darwin. It remains a much debated issue to what extent the main ideas of social Darwinism, which would frequently inspire active racism through race betterment initiatives and large scale and ultimately lethal eugenics, were actually shared by Darwin himself. There is some evidence, however, that early in Darwin's thinking, he was already linking his developing evolutionary views to the advancement of the human race. 
Darwin visited Australia in the 1830s and learned about the appalling massacre of Aborigines in Tasmania. It is clear that he held a low view of the Aboriginal peoples and regarded this now infamous episode in early Australian history as, quote, inevitable, end quote, and evidence of the survival of the fittest, recording the event and his views in his diary. On the other hand, there, appear to be, uh, in, uh, there appears to be enough good evidence to conclude that some of Darwin's keen followers, that's an interesting turn of phrase, maybe from the Dutch translation, were primarily responsible for the active promotion of the various human interventions that were to help along the process of race betterment on the basis of preconceived notions as to what sections of humanity were be, to be considered fittest. Herbert Spencer, who in 1864 in his book Principles of Biology, by the way, that's the first time I realized that he wrote on biology. I, uh, but apparently he did. Um, actually coined the term survival of the fittest after reading Darwin's Origin of Species. William Graham Sumner and Francis Galton, who may justifiably be called the father of modern eugenics, deserve special mention in this connection. And the role of Karl Marx in stimulating the kind of climate in which social Darwinism could flourish cannot easily be overemphasized. I have a little trouble with that particular statement. Um, Understandably, Charles Darwin had, at the very least, ambivalent thoughts about social implications of his evolutionary convictions, such as the desirability of eugenics. He knew that, from the standpoint of the survival of the fittest, his own family's prospects were rather dim. The Darwin clan was in various ways connected with the Wedgwood family, the owners of the famous pottery firm bearing that name, and Darwin himself was aware of the risks of marriages between cousins. At one time, when the Darwin family was uh, once again suffering a patch of ill health, Darwin wrote to one of his friends, we are a wretched family and ought to be exterminated. Um, that may have tempered his uh, feelings uh, for uh, uh, untrammeled uh, survival of the fittest. The untimely death of three of his ten children, in particular of his ten-year-old daughter Annie, on whom he doted more than on any of his other offspring, for some time cast deep shadows over his thinking about the evolutionary process. A recent and amply documented book quite convincingly argues that Charles Darwin firmly believed in the basic unity of the human race and did not share in the opinions of many of his contemporaries and of many subsequent Darwinians that some sections of mankind are inherently inferior to others. Darwin's close encounter with slavery early in his life, as well as the influence of the Wedgwood family, to which he was closely related and which was recognized as one of the most prominent voices of the time against slavery, made him forcefully reject bo both slave trading and slavery itself. Nonetheless, Darwin recognized that weaker races could, for various reasons, become extinct, and he did, at times, rationalize the darker sides of colonial supremacy. He recognized that programs to assist the disenfranchised and physically impaired might lead to a degeneration of the human race, but nevertheless, he believed that it was man's duty to look after the sick and needy. And there's a famous quote that backs that up. Others, looking at the same phenomenon as Darwin, came to different conclusions. The British sociologist, philosopher, and anthropologist Herbert Spencer is often referred to as the pioneer of social Darwinism. Spencer, not only inspired by uh, Darwin's ideas, but also heavily influenced by Lamarckism, believed that it would be much better for humanity in the long run if the weakest were allowed to perish. Because hmm. um, I didn't type that. I wonder how that crept in. Um, measures to help them overcome their plight, he believed, were not only against nature, but were harmful for the common good. Continuing, one of uh, Spencer's most cited statements regarding the weaker segments of society provides the gist of his thinking. And by the way, if you've ever read Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, you'll recognize this as uh, occurring during the discussion between Ebenezer Scrooge and uh, one of the ghosts of Christmas. Um, I think it's the ghost of Christmas present, but uh, if they are sufficiently 
complete uh, to live. They do live, and it is well that they live. If they are not sufficiently complete, they die, and it is best that they should die. And of course, applied to Tiny Tim was not quite what Ebenezer Scrooge had in mind. Um, even though he was prepared to allow for this process to be somewhat mitigated by the uh, spontaneous sympathy of men for each other, Spencer's approach in applying the biological scheme of evolution to society became very influential, in particular in the United States, where he was widely read and his views effectively popularized by others. Another important name connected with the origins of social Darwinism and its growing popularity in the 19th century was that of uh, William Graham Sumner, a renowned sociologist at Yale University. Building on concepts proposed by men like Malthus and Spencer, Sumner was more brutal in the strategies he advocated. He applied the principle of natural selection to the realm of economics and vehemently opposed the popular American principle of equality for all. The top dogs should uh, lawfully rule and do whatever they want. The laws of nature, he said, must do their work, even if this leads to unrestricted competition and vast inequalities in wealth. His belief in the survival of the fittest led him to fiercely oppose social legislation aimed at bettering the plight of the poor. Poverty, Sumner maintained, is simply part of the struggle for existence that must be allowed to run its natural course. He used his evolutionary determinism to bludgeon the soft-hearted reformism of government intervention of all types. A third prominent person who must be mentioned in this connection is Lester Ward an American paleobotanist, sociologist, and educator. He can only be described as a social Darwinist in a qualified sense. His working class background no doubt influenced his critical approach to the ideas of men like Spencer and Sumner. Though he saw history of mankind in terms of a relatively blind but somewhat progressive evolution of the social order, he believed that man as an intelligent and rational being is able to direct his further evolution. He opposed the philosophy of pure laissez-faire capitalism, and advocated a definite role for the government to stimulate human progress, especially through education. <coughs> Last affair capitalism itself, of course, uh, one of the very visible outcomes of applying Darwinian principles in economics and politics is the development of a ruthless uh, laissez-faire capitalism in the late 19th century and early 20th century America, a development that, one may argue, is still leaving its mark on some aspects of our current free market economy. It has been claimed that the single most important and controversial legacy of Darwinism to economic thought is the use of natural selection in justifying competitive selection in the marketplace. Although extreme laissez-faire capitalism was not limited to the United States and was also found elsewhere, most notably England, where it perfectly expressed the Victorian greed philosophy of the times, it flourished in America more than anywhere else. As a result of the Industrial Revolution, business boomed as never before as huge amounts of capital became available and the rapidly expanding rail network opened previously unheard of marketing opportunities. Competition became the fiercely affirmed law of American life. Everyone with a little money plunged into the market hoping to get richer quickly by finding a business which could crush its rivals. Inventors rushed to the patent office with their new devices and then hurried to find a capitalist to manufacture and sell them. Successful entrepreneurs often interpreted the survival of the fittest theory as an ethical concept that could sanction cutthroat economic competition. Darwinism helped them to justify their policies even when they were unethical or even illegal, as morally defensible and natural. Uh, their extremely individualistic approach, in which other persons often counted for nothing, suggested to them that it would be completely natural to exploit weaker companies. Sumner called the millionaires of his days the naturally selected agents of society who had been selected for success and could therefore be trusted with their great wealth and power. A diehard social Darwinist remained blind to the normative risk that occurred when the idea of natural selection is used as a conceptual anchor for competitive selection in economic life since it desensitizes people to the plight of those who bear the cost of competition selection and takes for granted that there simply will always be winners and losers in the marketplace. 
Though certainly not all captains of American industry of that period were primarily driven by Darwinian motives and the Protestant work ethic and the ideals of industriousness, industriousness and thriftiness no doubt also continued to play their part. Some of the most well-known icons of capitalism, often referred to by the pejorative term of robber barons, did not hide that they were inspired by Darwinian concepts. It suffices here to mention briefly two of them, the steel magnate Andrew Carnegie and the founder of Standard Oil, John D. Rockefeller. Both were controversial. They may have been detested as ruthless capitalists, but both men also have been highly admired for their philanthropic initiatives. Although to be fair, specifically in the case of Rockefeller, which I know a little more about, um, the philanthropy came after he had amassed a great deal of wealth and realized that it was not as fulfilling as he uh, had believed it would be. Carnegie adopted the Spencerian notion of evolution as progress. He had little regard for the interest of his workers, though he realized that the law of competition could be hard for individuals, he believed it is best for the race because it ensures the survival of the fittest. When Carnegie retired, he had more than just survived. He sold his company for $480 million to the banker John P. Morgan, who then enlarged the steel empire even further. And that was back when money was worth more than it is now. Rockefeller, the famous oil magnate, has been called the richest man in history. I think I just recently saw that he was really the third richest, but rich enough anyway. At any rate, he was the first American with a personal wealth uh, worth of more than $1 billion. In 1903, Rockefeller gave a speech in which he said that just as the American beauty rose can be produced in the splendor and fragrance that brings cheer to the beholder, only by sacrificing the early buds which grow up around it. So big business follows the laws of nature and the growth of a large business is merely the survival of the fittest. Like other big capitalists, Rockefeller readily adopted the scientific rationale that allowed him and his colleagues with a good conscience to do business in a Darwinian thought context that made them rich. Eugenics. Another outgrowth of a Darwinian thought was the dramatic development of the controversial eugenics movement. A typical dictionary definition of the term eugenics is the science of improving the population by control breeding for desirable inherited characteristics. As we will see, this controlling process has led to practices and policies of a dubious nature, to say the least. I'm going to skip over the next part, but uh, it's simply to say that uh, the questions are not uh, necessarily out of line. From antiquity onward, they have been those who encouraged healthy, productive, and intelligent people to reproduce, while individuals on the margin of society, such as the chronically ill or the mentally disabled, were dissuaded from doing so, either by custom or through law. But it was not until the end of the 19th century that a program of selective human breeding on, uh, based on systematic, supposedly scientific principles was proposed. In view of the strong emphasis on hereditary qualities, the link with Darwinism is immediately obvious. It has uh, aptly been referred to as Darwinism's most enduring trait. In the period between 1900 and 1940, both Darwinism and genetics found a more or less coherent expression in numerous eugenics initiatives. But it was only after the Nazi horrors of World War II became fully exposed that eugenics in their Darwinian garb became generally suspect. The term eugenics from the Greek meaning well-born was coined by Charles Darwin's half-cousin Francis Galton, the early promoter of the movement in its modern form. The term used to describe a new science that would focus on improving mankind by the judicious matching of parents who possess superior traits. Galton became one of the early leaders of the British Eugenics Society, which still exists today though renamed in 1989 as the Galton Institute. A major Christian concern of, is, of course, that eugenics is clearly based on the evolutionary idea that science will continually progress towards perfection with no need for any divine intervention, let alone a final judgment and the miracle of the creation of a new earth to replace the pleasant, present one. But that, of course, is not the only Christian concern. Um, the powerful movement that arose and quickly grew in Britain gained widespread support for scientists as well as politicians, while other influential individuals also weighed in. George Bernard Shaw, 
the Irish-born playwright, was among the strongest defenders of eugenics and repeatedly even spoke of the desirability of a lethal chamber in order to exterminate those who were not suitable to live. <coughs> Strenuous efforts in Britain to pass eugenics legislation were eventually successful. In 1912, the Feeble-Minded Persons Bill, which did not go as far as demanding compulsory sterilization as many had wanted, was to have made marrying a, person, a mentally deficient person or playing an active role in bringing about such a marriage a punishable misdemeanor. The bill was defeated, but renewed efforts one year later were successful when, with the full support of Winston Churchill, the Mental Deficiency Act, which allowed for the de detention of mentally defective persons, was passed. Uh, it's interesting to note that people who are otherwise pretty level-headed sometimes uh, uh, had trouble with this. The law remained on the books for over a half a century. Precisely at that time, the first international, international eugenics conference was held with Churchill as its vice chairman, resulting in further public pressure, which may have been an additional factor in getting the bill adopted. Several attempts to introduce bills that would proscribe sterilization measures were, however, rejected by the House of Commons, notably in 1931 and 1934, at a time when elsewhere in the Western world such legislation was being passed. That's got to be prescribed sterilization measures. Um, There is no space in this limited treatment of social Darwinism to list all the eugenics uh, initiatives that were seen in continental Europe. For several decades in the last century, eugenics flourished in Scandinavia. In Denmark, pelvic irradiation for female and vasectomy for male mentally impaired people was introduced. Since the acceptance of the first sterilization law in 1929 in Denmark, around 40,000 Scandinavians have been sterilized for eugenics reasons. In Sweden, around 18,600 peoples, predominantly women, were sterilized on eugenic or social grounds under the 1935 Swedish sterilization law before its repeal in 1975. But some estimates of the Swedish totals are considerably higher, certainly if those affected by subsequent new legislation are included. Iceland and Estonia had similar laws, and Switzerland passed a eugenics law in 1928 to control the gypsy population. This law was not repealed until 1972. We will return below to the unfortunate popularity of eugenics in pre-World War II Germany, but first we turn to the United States. The eugenics movement soon spread from Britain to the US, where in 1922 and 1928 respectively, the American Eugenics Society and the Human Betterment Foundation were established. The idea that hereditary mental illness could be halted by sterilization gained many adherents in the US. The first state that adopted a forced sterilization law was Indiana, an initiative that was eventually followed by many other states. An important role was played by an institution in New York that still exists today as a respected research center, but was known during the first period of its existence as the Station for Experimental Evolution, with Charles Davenport, a prominent American geneticist, in charge. It was established in 1904 with the financial assistance from the Carnegie Institute, that's Andrew Carnegie, the, and was to be closely linked to the Eugenics Record Office, which among other tasks collected a great amount of data on various characteristics of American families. This latter institution was also financially endowed by a rich philanthropist, Davenport's assistant, uh, Harry L. Laughlin, reigned supreme there for 30 years. He became an international authority on eugenics le legislation. It should be noted that he developed strong Nazi sympathies, which he never concealed. Oddly enough, the fact that he himself was an epileptic made him actually eligible for sterilization under the laws he championed. Just prior to World War II, Laughlin's eugenics activities were halted. Eugenics was not, was not only deemed laudable, but even necessary from the standpoint of improving the physical and mental condition of the American people. Financial arguments also played a continuing role since supporting the unfit was an enormous burden to the taxpayer. However, the linkage between moral traits and mental defects was the most important fact that the eugenicists had imbibed from Darwin. For many in American society, 
Dealing with those who were considered mentally defective became a matter of priority. The silent uh, population grew by leaps and bounds, and it could truly be said that the Darwinists had taken over the asylum. At the same time, the sentiment grew that just locking up the mentally deficient in asylums was not enough, and the further concrete measures were needed to ensure that the feeble-minded would not be able to procreate. The Buck versus Bell case in 1927 was of enormous importance in this connection. Three years earlier, the superintendent of the Virginia State Colony for Epileptics and Feeble-Minded had filed a petition with the authorities to be allowed to sterilize 18-year-old Carrie Buck, who was a patient in this institution, in his institution. Her mother had been diagnosed as retarded and had a record of prostitution and immorality. The daughter Carrie had, it was concluded, inherited these negative moral traits, which was confirmed by the fact that she had been given birth to an illegitimate child. Only later did it become known that Carrie had, in fact, been raped. The request led to lengthy litigation, which ended when, in an eight-to-one decision, the U.S. Supreme Court decided that mother and daughter were indeed feeble-minded and promiscuous, and that it was, therefore, in the state of Virginia's interest to have Carrie sterilized. The judge who wrote the ruling concluded that the interest of the state in a pure gene pool outweighed the importance of the bodily integrity of the individual. I think Oliver Wendell Holmes was famously said during this case to say that three generations of imbeciles is enough. The first sterilization law in Indiana had run into legal problems, but now a solid foundation was laid for this kind of legislation by the states. The Supreme Court okayed it. It has been estimated that in the 33 states that enacted such legislation, over 60,000 persons were subjected to this procedure. The last state to repeal its sterilization law was Oregon in 1983. Interestingly, Oregon also has a euthanasia uh, law that's probably more liberal than any place else in the U.S. However, even greater numbers of poor people were pressured into undergoing this procedure under federal programs, often with the threat that welfare payments would be withheld if the people concerned would not cooperate. White trash was targeted. But more often, African Americans and Native Americans received this dubious attention, and the project often seemed to be primarily aimed at purifying the Caucasian bloodline. From an Adventist perspective, it is interesting to note the keen interest in the eugenics movement on the part of John Harvey Kellogg, the Adventist health pioneer. Among many activities in this unbelievably energetic medical maverick was involved in were his initiatives and leadership in the areas of eugenics. In 1914, Kellogg renamed the American Medical Missionary Board as the Race Betterment Foundation. This was, of course, after his break with the church. He consciously adopted the eugenics terminology in order to gain wider support from adherents of the eugenics movement. In 1914 and subsequent years, Kellogg was the main player in, in the organization of some widely publicized race betterment conferences, where prominent speakers from the world of eugenics, including Davenport, were active participants. Kellogg was, of course, very much aware of the links between Darwinism and eugenics. He tried to play down this aspect as much as possible, in particular while he was still formally connected with the Adventist Church, which he had left in 1907. In all fairness, it should be mentioned, however, that he differed from men like Francis Galton in maintaining that hereditary developments went in two directions, and that also positive traits, once acquired, could be passed on. This, Kellogg believed, provided an extra rationale for his emphasis on health reform, since a healthier lifestyle would not only benefit the individual concern, but also the entire human race. Race betterment. Eugeni eugenics and racism were often not far apart, rather understandably. There can be little doubt that social Darwinism not only fueled eugenics, but also even uglier forms of racism. That the strong survive and overcome the weak is the Darwinian adagio. And that's the original word that they used. I'm not sure exactly what that's supposed to mean. Um, maybe it's adage. Uh, human life follows this, that pattern. Individuals, commercial companies, social classes, nations, and races struggle for supremacy, and the strong overcome the weak. Moreover, the poor and the weak are unfit to survive. Helping them violates the evolutionary process and is therefore wrong. Had not Darwin written in The Descent of Man about the likelihood that backward races would totally disappear from the face of the earth before the advance 
of higher civilizations. In the 19th century United States, the conviction grew that the Anglo-Saxon race in particular was much more developed and that other nations and ethnic groups would have to face up to that undeniable fact. The myth of Americans manifest destiny, the belief that the United States was destined to expand across the North American continent and which was first used in the 1840s to justify the annexation of Mexico. Um, I'm not sure that's not the way I understand history, but was strengthened by the Darwinian idea that a modern nation is like an organism that will either evolve or fall into decay. Hofstadler suggested that the Darwinian mood clearly sustained the belief in, Ang in Anglo-Saxon racial superiority that obsessed many American thinkers in the latter half of the 19th century. This conviction was vigorously expressed in the extremely popular book by the Reverend Josiah Strong, Our Country, Its Possible Future, and Its Present Crisis, of which hundreds of thousands of copies were sold. Strong had an uncanny ability for assimilating the writings of Darwin and Spencer to the prejudices of rural Protestant America and painted immigrants, Catholics, Mormons, saloons, and socialists equally as enemies of the Republic. And uh, one can see uh, faint traces of some of that still today. Uh, but the Anglo-Saxon people were the solution. And natural selection would ensure that a new and final physical type would emerge in the United States, better, bigger, stronger, taller than even the Scots. America, strong, ensured his readers would not only take care of Mexico, but would also prevail upon nations elsewhere in the world, and would in the competition of races clearly demonstrate the survival of the fittest. Madison Grant was an American radical who gained huge popular influence, a lawyer, historian, and physical anthropologist. He became especially known for his work as a eugenicist. In his famous book, The Passing of the Great Race, in 1916, he described the radical history in Europe and America. That should be italicized, and I missed that. The Nordic race, represented by the native New Englander, was clearly the ideal. Many of the early immigrants could qualify as Nordic. But he deplored the more recent arrivals in the U.S., those millions who had subsequently come from Southern and Eastern Europe, specifically um, Irish and Italians were under attack, but uh, uh, also Slavs. Uh, predictably, this sentiment led to various attempts at legislation to restrict immigration from less desirable population segments which eventually led to establishment of quotas for various groups, and that's still with us. One of the most tragic consequences was that these measures not only targeted some Southern European nationals, but would also keep out tens of thousands of Jews who desperately wanted to escape Nazi Germany. To my knowledge, little study has been done to determine to what extent Seventh-day Adventists in the period we considered in the above paragraphs were influenced by the sentiments of racial superiority of Americans of Nordic descent. Although it is well documented that several of the early Adventist pioneers were active in the late 19th century anti-slavery movement, a bias towards a sense of racial inequality would have been wrong, but not totally unexpected as Adventists originated and developed in particular among the Caucasian population in the Northeast of the United States and mainly recruited its members from among Protestants, many of whom were of Nordic descent. It cannot be denied that as time went on, in uh, Adventism in North America and in some other places had to deal with significant internal racial and ethnic tensions. But there seemed to be no evidence that either Ellen White or other leaders, while approving segregation between blacks and whites in the American context in which they found themselves, and though at times making some rather questionable remarks about black citizens, were motivated by any Darwinian-inspired theory of the inherent superiority of one race above another. And I'll have to say that when I was a kid, I was taught the little song Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white. Now red is politically incorrect and yellow is politically incorrect. And I, uh, sad. Uh, because the thought was such a good one. Um, Germany, an example of where social Darwinism can lead. Historians differ about the various influences that led Hitler to adopt his views on the desirability of an ethnically pure German Volk, and uh, actually that's folk. 
and the ever more drastic measures he ordered to bring this about. It has often been argued that uh, Nazi worldview was directly rooted in Darwinism. Such assertions need, at the very least, significant qualifications. Darwinism, with its teachings of natural selection and the survival of the fittest and its implications of racial inequality, does not inevitably lead to Nazism, and many convinced Darwinists only feel total abhorrence in the face of the policies of Hitler and his Nazi supporters. There can, however, be no doubt that Hitler imbibed social Darwinist ideas, and when these were blended with a virulent anti-Semitism, the Holocaust was the unimaginable result. The German historian Hans Guther Zmarzik points out that an analysis of social Darwinism reveals a process of declining standards, accompanied by a tendency to sacrifice the individual to the species, to devalue the humanitarian ideal of equality from the standpoint of natural inequality, and to subordinate ethical norms to biological needs. Most important, in the late 19th and early 20th century, Darwinism contributed a new way of thinking about life and death that led many avid Darwinists in Germany to devalue human life and to accept far-reaching eugenic measures, or even worse. The Jewish scholar Edward Simon aptly summarized this as follows. I don't claim that Darwin and his theory of evolution brought on the Holocaust, but I cannot deny that the theory of evolution and the atheism it engendered led to a moral climate that made a Holocaust possible. Undoubtedly, Hitler was subject to many different influences, but those of Darwin and Darwinian scholars were foremost among them. The uh, prominent Darwinian German scholar Ernst Haeckel, uh, the chief evolutionary apostle, apostle for racial purity, had a wide following in pre-World War II Germany, and his writings almost certainly had an impact on Hitler. In Hitler's library also was a copy of a translation of Madison Grant's book, The Passing of the Great Race, Hitler's biography, Alan Bullock seems more than justified when he said that crude Darwinism was, in, a sense, in essence, the basis of Hitler's political beliefs. The interest in eugenics in Germany did not begin when Nazism came to power, but at that point it entered a totally new phase. The first Nazi law that demanded forced sterilization was enacted in July 1933. It defined which individuals were to be subjected to sterilization. It included the following categories of people with a hereditary disease, congenital feeble-mindedness, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, hereditary epilepsy, hereditary St. Guy's dance, hereditary blindness, hereditary deafness, and severe bodily malformations. Also, persons affected by crises of alcoholism were listed. Thus far, this did not differ very much from similar laws that were enforced in many countries, among them the United States and it did not have overtly racist implications. This, however, was to change. In 1935, positive eugenics initiatives were launched to stimulate the production of Aryan infants. At the same time, eugenics through sterilization of unproductive and inferior elements of society became common and increasingly systematic. It is estimated that between 1934 and 1945, between 350,000 and 400,000 persons were sterilized. The sterilization of the ill, the mentally and physically handicapped, and the abnormal was now followed by extermination on a grand scale. Hundreds of thousands of persons were killed in a merciless campaign of, quote, mercy killings, end quote. One of the most infamous examples was the secret operation T4. The address of the extermination facility was Tiergarten 4 in Berlin, where between 70,000 and 100,000 defective children below the age of 17 were killed. The amazing fact is that the medical establishment was in general quite willing to comply with the Nazi directives. Sewell finds the explanation for this in the fact that Darwinian ideas, eugenics and its ugly sister eugenic euthanasia, were broadly accepted by the mainstream of the medical profession. He correctly comments that this terrible euthanasia program of Nazi Germany merged seamlessly with the Holocaust, which eventually killed millions of Jews and other peoples the Nazis considered undesirable and a threat to the pure Aryan race. An Adventist connection? Little has been published about the influence of the Nazi racial doctrines among Seventh-day Adventists in Germany until a meticulously documented study entitled Health Reform and Race Hygiene, Adventists in the Biometrical Vision of the Third Reich by Roland Blake uh, appeared in the prestigious journal Church History. It refers to an episode in Adventist history that many have preferred to forget. 
although Blank's study does not reveal how the Advent, average German Adventist church member thought about the lamentable trends in his country, and I've heard from some Germans who lived through that era um, exactly what they thought. It provides a clear picture of the concerns and attitudes of the church leadership and the position of some official church publications. To devote a few paragraphs to this regrettable episode is certainly justified, for it shows that even a group that, in theory, is determinedly anti-Darwinist may, under particular circumstances, fail to recognize that it has slowly but surely incorporated ideas of social Darwinism into its thinking. In the late 1930s, the German Seventh-day Adventist leaders were, it appears, primarily structured, uh, primarily focused on the survival of the organization and its structure. A complicating factor was, no doubt, that the fact that Adventism could easily attract negative attention from the Nazi authorities because of its Jewish features, such as the worship on Saturday and adherence to particular health prescripts, clean meat, for example. To lessen that danger, German Adventist leaders eagerly utilized the chance to enlist their health principles, the right arm of the message, to work with the state in programs to strengthen the German race. The church's well-organized, efficient welfare organizations were well-suited to that purpose. Didn't uh, hurt that Hitler didn't smoke. Uh, Hulda Jost not only provided dynamic leadership for the German Advent welfare work, but was also able to build a significant uh, network of contacts with high officials. She actively and successfully pursued close association with Nazi organizations developed to the welfare of das Volk, meaning the interests of those of uh, pure racial uh, German vintage people. Um, from 1933 onward, German Adventist publications supported that approach. Remarkably enough, the church's periodicals joined the mainstream in support of natural law or Darwinian principles and supported the attempts of Nazi rulers to reverse the threatening decline of the, of the Nordic race. Black noted, notes that in its association with the programs of the state, the Adventist health reform message underwent a significant transformation. While continuing the traditional emphasis on healthful living, he writes, Adventist publications soon adopted elements of the Nazi racial agenda as well. Thus, in effect, contradicting the church's characteristic anti-Darwinist stance. A curious path led from Caritas, the caring for the less fortunate and weak, to elimination of the weak as the work of God. And today, in this chapter, we've looked briefly at some of the ultimate consequences of belief in Darwinian principles. While our, emph our emphasis has been mainly historical, based on the firm conviction that we must learn the lessons of yesterday if we want to live wisely today, it seems that a lot of learning is yet to be done. Ann Coulter, an outspoken and controversial American columnist and public publicist is a fierce critic of Darwin's ideas. In her usual provocative way, she says she is not surprised that psychopaths gravitate toward, toward Darwinian views. Darwin, she claims, enshrined biological instincts rather than moral values. For that reason, his ideas continue to have strong appeal, especially among liberals, since it lets them morally off the hook. But in thinking of the present-day danger of social Darwinism, we need not just refer to such disturbed individuals as those we met in the opening paragraph of, of this chapter. The issue is much broader than this. Contemporary evolutionary psycho psychologists maintain, as Darwin suggested, that our moral sentiments have, to a large extent, a biological basis, and qualities we used to refer to as virtues or vices are, in fact, mainly genetically based. It should be clear to any Christian believer that this has major implications. Contemporary sociobiologists tend to explain ethical institutions in terms of inherited patterns of behavior, even if it be seated that they provide some valuable insights, as John C. Polkinghorne um, is willing to do. It must be remembered that the Darwinian explanation tells too banal a story. Polkinghorne strongly believes that the Darwinian philosophy is not able to account for radical altruism. The ethical imperative that leads a person to risk his or her own life in the attempt to save an unknown and unrelated stranger from the danger of death. Love of the incalculable kind, of that incalculable kind, eludes Darwinian explanation. 
Much more could be said, but space does not allow. In conclusion, one thing, however, needs to be stressed. Though many have learned the lessons of the Holocaust and realize how catastrophic the idea of inherent superiority of one race or ethnicity over the other can be, not all have done so. Racism and sentiments of ethnic superiority are still rampant around the globe. Questionable theories of eugenics are still very much alive in many quarters. Economic theories that require only the fittest to survive are still being propagated. Christians realize or should do so. That the naturalistic presuppositions of Darwin's evolutionary theories and of those who further developed them are much stronger and more generally accepted today than in his day. In our contemporary world, more and more is attributed to nature, to our genetic makeup, to the laws that govern the biological, psychological, economic, even moral and religious aspects of our lives. In spite of a, welcoming correction, a welcome correction from some political parties and official statements by churches and individual church leaders, and the fact that many people are waking up to the dangers of cold materialism and superficial consumerism, far too little attention is still given to man's God-given privilege to respond to something beyond himself, to make conscious choices, and to influence his own life and, in his, and his environment in responsible ways. As the Creator God is accorded less and less space in our secularized Western world, and as His voice is more and more silenced, the danger of, uh, dangers of immoral and destructive Darwinian theories are more rather than less dangerous in today's world than they were in the days of our parents and grandparents. Now, I think that my own take on this is Dr. Brinsman makes some very good points. Um, and he does fit in with the plan of the book, the defense of the scriptural theory of Genesis, and there's those 10 chapters on theology that we won't go back through. This is almost a theology in a way. And then there's a, a covering various uh, aspects of, uh, uh, of science and its influence on this particular topic. And then now we're talking about evolutionary ethics, which is, uh, uh, that's where it fits, and of course we'll get to theistic evolution the comp the uh, attempted compromise between evolution and creation. Um, the chapter is mostly very good, making some very valid points and approaching the subject in a balanced way. Uh, I appreciate its restraint on the Hitler subject. I sometimes I've seen Hitler uh, used as an obvious a knockdown argument, and if you discuss people, uh, discuss Hitler with people, you'll find out it's not quite as much of a knockdown argument as you thought. Unfortunately, I think there are a few flaws which make me uncomfortable recommending the chapter without some kind of qualification. Um, first, uh, medical research and practice has not been deeply affected by evolutionary principles, I, I don't think. Um, with the possible exception of abortion, which of course is a big thing, but most physicians really don't have much to do with that. Um, the evolutionary framework that the great majority of geologists work within, I think is better termed a long age framework. I am sympathetic to Brinsma's problem because I uh, started out using that uncritically myself. But in, fa in fact, it uh, outlines two important points. Um, uh, one of them is the geologists don't generally concern themselves with evolution per se. And perhaps more importantly, the Long Ages came before evolution, and in fact, the Long Ages pushed people towards evolution and not vice versa. And if we're going to recognize what's going on, I think we have to um, we have to realize that long age is as much of a problem as evolution. Um, and I think that'll become more apparent when we deal with uh, the next chapter. The other thing is that the divergence between apes and man is variously dated at five to seven million years ago, depending on who you're listening to but not 70 million years ago. And when people read that, they're going to go, oh. And it detracts from their listening to the rest of the, uh, of the talk. I don't see Karl Marx as stimulating the kind of climate in which social Darwinism could flourish. 
Um, Karl Marx, I think, believed in Darwin. And he believed that we had to, you know, kind of pull ourselves out of it. Um, and I think he made mistakes. But I don't think social Darwinism was one of them. And I think that when we make those statements, it, uh, it grates a little funny. Uh, Mexico was never next to the United States. Uh, Texas and various other states were, but not Mexico itself. And, and in fact, I'm not aware of a major thrust of trying to bring Mexico into the United States as a territory. Um, I could stand to be corrected on that. But uh, certainly it needs more defense than the, what it was stated in the, in the article. I think these inaccuracies decrease the value of what I consider otherwise a well-written account. Now, I think the account can be used as a reference or bibliography source. In other words, if you're discussing the subject, it will be helpful to have read what Brunsma has to say. And then that way, you can kind of leave out the parts where he's uh, missed it a little bit here and there. Um, or perhaps recommended with the appropriate caveats. Uh, um, the other thing that was just really odd when I reflected on it was that Brinsman is completely silent about the euthanasia movement that is now full steam ahead in the Netherlands. And he was president of the conference, or of the union. And he is now president of Luxembourg con uh, conference, which is right next door. And to me, the complete absence of commentary on euthanasia in the Netherlands is just striking. Now, to be fair, I have now taken up all the official time, but uh, for those of you who can still hang around, uh, uh, I welcome your comments and questions. I have a question. I, I read that Adventists in Germany not only compromise on certain issues regarding uh, Darwinism, but also on the Sabbath and military service by Adventists. Uh, I read that. I, I don't remember the sources, but maybe you do. <laughs> It wouldn't surprise me. Um, um, I, I read of one particular person who was uh, drafted into military service, and of course, if you don't go, you die. Um, and uh, he was forced to wear a gun, and he carved a wooden one that was lifelike enough to look like a gun, and lived through the uh, through his service, knowing that if somebody discovered the gun, he was likely to, if he was lucky, be in jail, and if he was unlucky, be killed on the spot. Um, and uh, it is not easy to live under the gun. What I would like to know from some people who were actually there is whether a liberal, whether a conservative, maybe whether a Christ-centered approach to Adventism was of any help in resisting uh, the government in that particular era. I don't know. Um, it would be interesting to find out. I think one of the things that we don't do enough of is to learn from our previous history. And uh, I think that there's, there are certain events that, that uh, uh, I think uh, that uh, our approach to Nazi Germany 
um, could be considered a type of the approach that one might expect at, uh, at uh, just before the coming of Christ. And I think it's important for us to kind of uh, go through and try to f understand what's going on. I, I think the same thing is true in the Soviet Union. You know, the church bifurcated there. There were the accommodationists and the non-accommodationists. Um, and then when uh, the Soviet Union collapsed, the non-accommodationists were interestingly treated as second-class citizens. Uh, and there was a, bad, a lot of bad blood between the two. That uh, actually happened in the Roman Empire when the Christian church finally came out of being a persecuted sect into being a protected sect. Um, you know, we, we have nothing to fear unless we fail to see how God has led us in the past, but um, sometimes we don't pay enough attention to how God has led us in the past. I, I think we had a comment, uh, a couple of comments. Uh, go ahead and then pass the mic back. First, I want to thank you for putting that together. That was pretty amazing. Well, don't uh, thank me. Thank uh, uh, Brunsma. Yeah. You put them all, did you all highlight it? Was it in the book highlighted like that as far as um, PowerPointed? Oh, oh no. I, I did. Uh, well, yeah. I, I figured out a way to use uh, optical character recognition and steal stuff. So that's why some of those things I know they weren't my typos because they came out of the program. I see. Okay. I see. Um, natural selection. That's just looking at that concept, there is some truth in it, but we don't exactly, I for one don't have an exact way of explaining it. All I know is that this natural selection from science seems to come from reducing everything to machines, superior machines. And what's weird about it is that you can get two men together equipped one of those machines with a gun and all of a sudden he's superior. He can go and shoot the other guy. Superiority. And the other machine no longer works. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So it's, it's just kind of goes nowhere. Um, now we know studying theology that there is a selection going to take place. It's a selection between good and evil. What's the criterion of that? That is, that is kind of what we're studying right now, and that's what we're trying to come up with, that we could tell everybody that they, everybody can understand. Um, but it's a little bit difficult when you put it together with this Darwinian selection. So, you know, that, this really brings up the challenge that we've got here, kind of for the last days here, is, is how is that going to be accomplished so that people will make a decision one way or the other. Go ahead. Do we have anybody over here? The comment about Sabbath keeping is interesting in that those of us who have an occupation that get a free ride on that for taking care of people um, medically, if, you know, not electively perhaps, but on an emergency basis compared to... Yeah, my, and I'm my, an emergency physician, so everything right. I do is emergencies. Right, and the, my children who say, why, why is my occupation that much different than yours sometimes? And then you look at uh, whether you have a choice, uh, which one of the commandments are you going to obey? If you're a father and have children to support and you're going to die for keeping Sabbath and your children are going to starve to death, did you violate the, the commandment for not to commit murder? And so I have get less judgmental of others making their own choice. I'll leave that to them and God to decide whether they made the right choice or not, and I'll try and do the best I can to honor my God and the choices I make. Uh, I agree, and uh, I think that it, it's a lot easier to lay those uh, choices out for other people than it is to live through them yourself. And it's one of the reasons why I think that we need to be really careful even for those whom we think are falling. Um, Max Locato wrote a book 
Kato, I don't know how to say his name, called Outlive Your Life. And an interesting set of questions he asked in there. He said uh, he was asked three questions, and they changed his life. And one, one that was posed to him, one of the questions posed to him changed his life. The three questions were, well, if you had been alive in Nazi Germany during the time period, what would you have done to help the Jews? And you, you'd like to think that you would have done something, but he says, I wasn't alive then. And then they asked, somebody asked him, well, if you had lived through the social unrest of the uh, racism in the United States, what you, would you have done about it? And he said, I really didn't experience that. He said, but then when they asked me that this, this is the richest nation, Christians in the history of the world, and there are so many people starving to death, what will I answer my grandchildren? When I'm asked, what did I do about that? And those kind of questions we have to face up to just as much as what we did on Sabbath or other issues because we are the richest Christian We're. Well, we're, we're probably still marginally the richest, and that may even change. Well, the richest but, set of Christians in the existence of the world. I don't think Christianity has ever had more wealth in the terms of the people that claim to be Christians in any previous time in the world. Not this country, but Christianity as a whole. Uh, I think that's true. And I, I think that that brings up one of the points is, uh, I, we were discussing earlier, um, some people here and, and myself, and one of the things that came up was, uh, uh, Capitalism is probably the most efficient way known to man of, of distributing wealth to continue to make more wealth. Um, and uh, I, I think as a tool, it's extremely useful. You know, you work hard, you get paid for it. You uh, work smart, you get paid for it. People tend to do what they're paid to do. On the other hand, if you make it an absolute rule, if you take a kind of libertarian philosophy that somehow if we just had uh, totally free markets, why everything will take care of itself, um, There's still going to be people with cancer. Uh, and some of those people are still going to be poor enough that they're going to need help. And in medicine in particular, we've always practiced socialized medicine. We haven't called it that. But we always have. You know, when my dad practiced in Missouri, some people paid him in chickens. Well, also, uh, uh, somebody's noted that before all these programs came in, 25% of the practices and the physicians in Redlands was donated. It was, they took care of the poor. I mean, it was just 25% of the average physician's practice was free. Mm -hmm. Until all these other programs came in, that was the modus operandi. And, uh, and uh, uh, you know, there were hospitals that got paid by the county to to take care of the poor. And uh, I suppose you could argue that they are not as well equipped as the, uh, as the ones that the poor are now able to get into. Um, There's an interesting book called What's So Great About Christianity that um, has some interesting points in it. but. Uh, with Christianity under attack, a lot of the social conscious issues really stem from Christianity. If you go through a, a Hindu point of view, it is, and somewhat Buddhist, yes, I should be good to people because I don't want to come back again at a lower level, but I do not have to feel sorry for them for where they're at because it's because what they did last time put them in that social status or that condition. Christianity is substantially different than that, and you can one of the, I think the reasons America was so successful is you had capitalism tempered by a Christian ethic social accountability which is not uniformly true in all religions although you're supposed to do the right thing 
a lot of that right thing has to do with where I'm going to end up again next time around, not a social conscience. And so well, I think it's, it's the difference between the principle, don't do anything to people that you don't want them to do to you, and do unto others as you would have them do unto you, which is, uh, the, the formal is a negative, just, you know, don't kill people, don't hurt people, don't, uh, and it's, it's good morality, don't get me wrong, it's just incomplete. Because, you know, when Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan, he completely reverses the question of who is my neighbor, who do I need to take care of, see, which is love your neighbor as yourself. And he says, who was the neighbor to this guy, implying that you need to go out and almost look for neighbors. Um, and, and I think that if you put that principle into it, then in a sense, capitalism becomes complete. But if you take that principle out, I think that everybody, atheists included, you know, Darwin, uh, or Darwin, Dawkins will say that, you know, and socially, I'm not a Darwinist. He says, I, you know, I think we need to do some very un-Darwinian things. Um, and, I mean, that's true for everybody. You know, they see the poor and they see, uh, un until people are told, no, it's okay, you don't have to worry about the poor because they're there because it's their fault. I think that it's something that, if you could put it that way, it's a natural law. It's something that God put innately into people's hearts to say, no, you can't do that to those people. They need help and you need to help them. Even if you're an atheist. And it's only our, our ideologies that get in the way of that that stop that from happening. Um, uh, or certainly stop that from being sensed. And so if we're capitalists and we don't take care of the poor, one way or another, and I'm, uh, you know, I'm not, it's arguable that private philanthropy is better than government philanthropy because it does a better job of picking and choosing who really is poor and who's just, you know, lazy. Um, but uh, but if, if, if people don't do it on their own, then you'll have people clamoring for the government to step in. You just will. What you said uh, reminds me of the recent case in Libya. Uh, this man, uh, if I recall correctly, his name is Wood, last name. The father, uh, you know, is asking for an explanation of what happened. But he, when he learned that uh, the embassy or uh, consulate was being, was under attack, he asked permission from the CIA to go and help him. And the CIA said, no, stay where you are. And he said three times, no. Yeah. And he disobeyed the order, saved, uh, I think, 30 people, and he paid with his own life for disobeying orders. He was killed. So that's the kind of, I mean, why did he do that? Was he an Adventist? No. Was he maybe of some other religion? We don't know. But uh, I tend to feel that people, no matter what their religion, they have in an innate desire to help, you know, when help is needed. I, I think that the people struggle with two different desires. They have their own self-protection desire and they have the desire to help others. And sometimes those things fuse and then there's no problem because everybody just does what feels the right thing to do. Sometimes those things diverge. And I think wherever they do, we have the obligation to follow the loving thing. And frankly, if there's one point that we can make in Adventism that would be more central than any other point, it is that point. There is such a thing as love and that uh, 
that that such a thing is something that we should be following. And in fact, to me, that's the big danger of an evolutionary point of view that says, well, it's fit to survive, and so you, you, know, you shouldn't waste your breath on all these other inferior types because you need to protect yourself as a number one. I think that that is actually the, the single most damaging part of uh, evolutionary theory. Um, and it's also the single most difficult part of evolutionary theory. How do you explain altruism, truly unselfish giving, if the way we have advanced all these years, all these decades, all these centuries, all these millions of years, the way uh, the standard theory goes, is uh, that uh, you take care of yourself and your kids and that's it. Maybe your brothers and sisters. Can I add something else? Uh, we, <coughs> we see this principle demonstrated by the life of Jesus. If the survival of the fittest is a good principle, then there was no point in Jesus coming down to help the poor, the, those in trouble. He should have said, you know, if I survive, I'll stay just where I am. I mean, why should I go down and worry about these, uh, you know, people who made, I mean, their life miserable, their own fault. Let them perish. You know, the interesting thing of it is, I find very few people who are not influenced by Charles Dickens' the Christmas Carol in that famous scene where Ebenezer Scrooge is being talked to by the ghost of Christmas present, I think it was, and saying, you know, they're, you know, if they survive, why they deserve to survive. If they don't survive, they don't deserve to survive. Who uh, uh, was actually quoting Spencer straight out, I think. I have to go back and look at the, the exact quote, but it was, it was so close that I, I can't, Imagine that he wasn't actually copying it right out of the book. Um, and, and Dickens is holding this up and saying, look, you know better than that. And I think we all do. That doesn't mean that some of us, most of us on occasion, will fail to rise to that level or will not fail. It, we, do, we do have trouble putting that into practice. But I think we all recognize that, in fact, that is the ideal. Well, um, next Sabbath, uh, God willing, we'll be talking about uh, genetics, uh, um, uh, modification, and... Um, the week after that, we'll be talking about uh, the video if everything goes right. So we'll see you then.